Welcome to the Not All Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. The show covering all things health, wellness, culture, and more. The show for all of us who aren't old, we're better. Each week, we'll interview superstars, experts, and ordinary people doing extraordinary things, all related to this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Now, here's your host, the award-winning Paul Vogelzang. Welcome, listeners, to another captivating episode of the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Today, we journey into the heart of urban wilderness to unveil a story of majesty, mystery, and survival. Imagine a top of the food chain predator, not the bear or mountain lion you might expect, but a creature equally formidable and far closer to home. We're talking about the great horned owl a silent guardian of the night skies thriving in every state of Hawaii across diverse habitats from dense forests to our very own backyards. I'm Paul Vogelsang, and our guest today is Smithsonian Associate Mark Glenshaw, an award-winning naturalist who's dedicated over 17 years to observing these magnificent birds, the great horned owls. His focus? A particular group of great horned owls in St. Louis's Forest Park, and one owl in particular named Charles. Mark's work is not just a study, it's a testament to the bond formed between human and owl, offering deep insights into their complex world. Mark Lenshaw will be presenting at Smithsonian Associates coming up, so please check out our show notes today for more information on Mark Glenshaw and his full presentation at Smithsonian Associates. But we have Mark Glenshaw today to tell us briefly as tease of his upcoming presentation. And through Mark's eyes, we will explore the silent flight natural habitats, the familial bonds of these wonderful great horned owls. Mark Glenshaw tells us today about his journey and what it reveals, not just the science, but the soul of these incredible creatures. This episode is more than just an exploration with Mark. It's an invitation to all of you to join us at Smithsonian Associates coming up to look beyond the familiar and discover the extraordinary lives unfolding silently around us. Join us as Mark and I delve into the world of the great horned owl today. Mark Glenshaw uncovers the wonders of wildlife that share our neighborhoods. Prepare to be enthralled, enlightened, and inspired. This is the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series where every story brings us closer to the marvels of the natural world. Let's begin. Mark Lenshaw, welcome to the program. Thank you so much for having me on, Paul. This is a real honor and pleasure. Anytime I get to share the owls and my work with them is great. And uh, with such a, a wide and diverse audience, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. Oh, gosh, me too. I uh, I thank you. I, I've had a chance to do some research on you. Uh, the Smithsonian Associates team has shared with me a bunch of information. I think this is just going to be a fascinating presentation coming up at Smithsonian Associates but I'm just excited to talk to you today too. We we have you for a little bit and we're going to we're going to just jump right into it and maybe maybe we can just start there and just tell us briefly about your upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation. We're all on Zoom these days and so how will you be using Zoom to engage our audience? I love that you used the word engage. Whenever I present whether it's virtual on Zoom or in person I just did my first owl talk in Tennessee last week. Oh, wow. Anytime I present, I try and really hit what I call the E words, and engage is definitely one of them. You have to connect with people. So the other E words I use are energetic. You have to have a healthy, positive energy going, engage, and entertain. We're going to have some laughs in our talk about owls. You might think about, well, where are the laughs about owls? Trust me, it'll be a hoot. <laughs> and then through it all, good. educational. Uh-huh. Educational. Thank Another you. E-word. We're going to learn a, bu- a lot of stuff, and it's not going to be in a droning, great horned owls, the most widespread. <laughs> no, I'm going to 
do my best to make this subject really come alive. So I'm going to be sharing not only my talking head, but also photos and videos. And not just photos and videos of here's some random owl somewhere, but no, these are the individual owls that I've been studying for 18 years in a place called Forest Park, a large urban park right in the middle of St. Louis, Missouri. And I'll give some background about the park to kind of get us all on the same page. And then I'm going to talk about how I came upon the owls. We'll go over some basic facts about the species. And then I'm going to demonstrate with my photos and videos many of the amazing behaviors of these beautiful birds and also intertwining the natural history with the personal history of these individual birds that I've been lucky to share a part of their lives with. Well, thank you for that. And, and congratulations, 18 years. That is really an accomplishment, that, impressive and inspiring, too. I, I uh, As I say, my wife and I thank love you. birding and, and birds, and so this is really an, just inspiring work that you do. Was there a moment or maybe just an initial experience that really sparked this interest in, in these beautiful birds, these these massive predators? Definitely. I don't want to give too much of my mm-hmm. talk away. Yeah, yeah. But I, but I can't say that I had a, a very healthy grounding to get into this. I've been into wildlife all of my life. And before I saw the owls, I was starting to go to this beautiful urban park in St. Louis Forest Park and spend a lot of time there studying the wildlife. So I had a really healthy basis from which to start with the owls. But I really wasn't even looking for owls. I knew almost nothing about owls, but I knew enough to know that owls are really hard to find. I lead about 70 tours a year, tours called Owl Prowls, so that people can see and learn about the owls that I study. And I'll often have people in their 70s and 80s who have never seen an owl Mm -hmm. because they are so hard to find. So I was just literally going through the park one day and I passed the two great horned owls that I began to study and literally that first sighting in 20 to 30 minutes, again, I'll talk all about it uh, next month with mm-hmm. the Smithsonian Association, mm-hmm. yep. uh, so Smithsonian Associates, mm-hmm. but that 20 to 30 minutes literally changed my life. Mm-hmm. I mean, 19 years ago, if you had said, Mark, you're going to be studying owls and giving talks about owls and leading tours and giving interviews about your work with owls, I would have said, I'm very concerned about your mental health and or <laughs> your intake of psychotropic substances. <laughs> Well, one of the two owls, I think, was Charles that you met then, Charles the Great. Yeah. So what was it about Charles that was the attraction and and what distinguishes Charles in terms of uh, other great horned owls? Oh, how much time do we have? Yeah, this is our tease. So your Smithsonian (laughs) Associates presentation will be full and wonderful. And this is our way of just getting people excited about that. So, yeah. (laughs) And even the presentation is like, oh, wait, I can keep going. I know it's hour four, but really, (laughs) the superlatives with great horn owls are numerous. And the superlatives about Charles are equally vast. Charles is just an incredible great horned owl. I've been very lucky to have seen many other great horned owls in the St. Louis region, other parts of the world, and in captivity. But there is definitely something about Charles that just stands out. He's an, you're never going to find an ugly great horned owl, but Charles got in the gorgeous line twice. Mm. And he is just an amazing individual. One of the, the great joys and honors and surprises of my work is that I mentor people about owls. And one of my friends and mentees, uh, Brenda Henty, has been studying the same female great horned owl for 12 to 13 years. And she studied Charles and company for many years with me. And anytime she comes to Forest Park and sees Charles, she just shakes her head and says, oh, my gosh, there's no one like him. He's just such a special owl. And I led an owl prowl last night and my group came away with the exact same impression that, wow, owls are amazing, and then there's Charles. Hi, it's Paul. Do you love entertaining, informative, eclectic, insightful programs about culture, health, science, life, 
and everything Smithsonian. As part of our Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, we're introducing you to the new Smithsonian Associates streaming series. Smithsonian, a nonprofit organization, is excited to present this new aspect of their 55 years as the world's largest museum-based educational program. Join us from the comfort of your home as we periodically interview Smithsonian Associate guest speakers. Our audience here on radio and podcast can explore our website for more information, links, and details at notold-better.com. Thanks, everybody. Our guest, of course, today is Mark Glinsha. Mark will be talking about great horned owls hiding in plain sight. We'll have more details about Mark, his upcoming presentation, his work with owls, and details about the Smithsonian Associates. So please check out show notes for all of those links. It'll take you directly to where you can find Mark and Charles. So let's talk a little bit about the community of, of Forest Park that's grown up around Charles and and their impact because the community and, – and you talk a little bit about this. In, in my research of, of you, I found that it's important to have – and we'll go back to this word again. It's important to have this engaged kind of community because that influences you and your research, but it also leads to some wildlife conservation, which is, is so important with regard to these owls. Yes, and uh, the community that has grown out of the owls is just, again, another surprise and joy and honor – And it's people of all different walks of life. I mean, I've been mentoring people about owls almost as long as I've been studying them. And among the people that I have mentored and I'm mentoring are teachers. We have a violinist, an award-winning botanist and horticulturalist, a chef, a mom who's developing a growing career in historical cemeteries. We've had a gentleman that ran a bike tour and rental business out of Forest Park. And we're different ages and stages and professions and socioeconomic, ethnic, you name it. And it's not that I've become friends and I've mentored these people in kind of a one-to-one thing. We've all become friends. People that wouldn't have met otherwise have all connected through the owls. And that's just kind of a core group. And then there are other people that come out a few times a year, maybe four times a month, but they're still fascinated by these owls and still have connected in so many different ways. So the community is really important in showing that, like me, anyone can do this. I'm not a trained scientist. This is not how I earn my living. I studied history in college. But anyone can study nature in a very rewarding way, not only for themselves, but for other people. And having this community of people also makes it really imperative to me that I know what's going on and that I can communicate what's happening with the owls very quickly and in different ways, That whether it's a a post on social media or, you know, a four second conversation. I saw somebody the other day I hadn't seen for a while. They're like, what's been happening with the owls? And I said, when were you last year? And they said, oh, uh, about 10 weeks ago. And I said, okay, here's the very short version because a lot has happened. So all of these things help me communicate. And again, that great word, engage and connect people with the owls. We learned yesterday, sadly, of the passing of Flacow, the the Eurasian owl who who died in Manhattan. And mm. Flacow was known as probably the most photographed bird uh, in in the world. And yes. Flacow lived, yeah, very sad. And um, and then there were Flacow sightings. There were websites devoted to Flacow. An enormous community around Flacow who who lived in in downtown Manhattan uh, amongst the buildings. Um, sadly, uh, uh, likely killed by flying into a building. Yes. Is it unusual for these uh, these top apex predators to live in, you know, the green spaces of a, of a city? And how, do, how does Charles kind of adapt? Because these buildings are ever present. And of course, we are ever present. And um, how do they make it their own space into their own e- ecosystems? 
That's that's a, such an important question, and one of the many superlatives about great horn owls is how adaptable they are. Mm -hmm. Great horned owls are the most widespread, commonly found owl species in North America. They are found in every state except Hawaii. Wow. Every province and territory of Canada. And if that was enough, they're found throughout much of Latin America. And not just, oh, I'm in little pockets of these places. They live in almost every habitat in the Americas. And they're incredibly adaptable. I live right in the city of St. Louis, and I've had a male great horn owl in my next door neighbor's backyard. Hmm. And these owls are incredibly adaptable. One of the few places where you won't find great horn owls are highly populated, densely urbanized areas. They look like, like a downtown area. Mm -hmm. And that there's just not enough of what they need. In contrast, you're going to find them almost everywhere else. A little exercise I do any time I travel anywhere is I'll look out my window and I'll ask myself, this area that I'm seeing right before my eyes, would this work for a pair of great horned owls? And the answer, more often than not, is yes, this would work for a pair of great horned owls because they are so adaptable. Mm -hmm. Just in the St. Louis region, I've seen them in a big park like Forest Park, mm -hmm. which is just under 1,300 acres. Actually, it's 500 acres larger than Central Park. Mm -hmm. And I'm a former New Yorker, so I, mm -hmm. I say that with uh, mm -hmm. mutual pride in both cities. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen them in big yards, small yards, golf courses, cemeteries. These guys are just everywhere, not just great horned owls, but owls in general. And owls are definitely one of those things where you start scratching the surface and you realize two things pretty quickly. One, that, wow, owls are indeed all over the place. And geez, that means they've been here all this time. They're Hardly. just hiding in plain sight. <laughs> Good. The, the name of your upcoming presentation with Smithsonian Associates, Mark Lynch, as our guest. And we will have lots of links so that we can find out more information about Mark Lynch and his work, the owl prowls that he's done. Uh, Mark, you over the years, you've really had a chance to observe owl families to witnessing some courtship, some nesting, the raising of owlets. The, these are these mm. are complex uh, birds, and you've documented that. And I wonder if you have a particular, again, you know, with a nod to just wetting our appetite a little bit and just kind of getting us excited about your upcoming presentation, just maybe give us one memorable interaction that you had or one behavior that you documented that really does highlight how intensely complex these these creatures are. That's a great question. The, the highlights of the moments are legion, mm -hmm. and I'm actually going to pick what happened last night. Last night was very, very interesting. Just to summarize briefly, Charles got a new mate last year. I haven't had a chance to write about her in full in my blog. I've mentioned her in my most recent blog post. And yes, I continue to uh, win the award for world's worst blogger <laughs> in terms of keeping my blog up to you're, date. You're busy with lots of stuff, though, so we're, we're going to give you a pass on all that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but Charles got a new mate last year. I named her Tess, and they became a pair. And when they became a pair, the window for mating and nesting had closed. So they did not have young last year. And then Tess, unfortunately, has disappeared. We last saw Tess on November 16th. And given that they were right on the cusp of hopefully mating and nesting, unfortunately, the pretty much the only conclusion I can draw is that Tess has died. Mm -hmm. We have not found her body or heard reports from someone else, but we have not seen her. And again, they're right on the cusp of mating and nesting, and I can't think of a good alternative reason for a female to leave kind of two weeks before the Super Bowl. Yeah. Oh, pardon me, the That's... superb owl. <laughs> Very now, good. Nice but... touch. Had to have that Kansas City Chiefs res reference in there despite living in St. Louis, huh? <laughs> And I'm still a Washington Commanders fan, having grown up in the Washington area. And yes, uh, wow, it's been a tough uh, 30 years. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'm a San Francisco um, 49ers fan, so oh, it's been a tough, you know, yeah, tough few weeks. Is it close? 
<laughs> You're not tasting that cigar. Yeah, yeah. So right. Tess has is off the stage and very quickly after her disappearance and sadly her likely death, a new female showed up and has hmm. been here now for the better part of three months. And this new female is young. Great Hornells generally don't mate and nest until they're two to three years old. Females will occasionally nest in their first year. This female is in her first year. She's 13 to 15 months old. And she arrived within the window to mate and nest, but between her youth and Charles's vast experience, Charles has been kind of hesitant with her, and she has demonstrated that she's still learning how to be an adult great horned owl. So they could have made it and nested, but they did not. Now, last night, the female was doing something she's been uh, doing recently, which has been interesting. I've seen it a little before. She's been making a food-related call that reproductive females make. This food-related call sometimes is an out-and-out -out food demand call. Hey, male, in this case, Charles, you need to bring me food and bring your young food. Well, this young female, and I'm circling a name for her, doesn't have eggs, doesn't have young. And she's been making this food call while intermixing the food calls with her regular beautiful hoot. So last night they had a couple of interactions of hooting. They were at a past and possibly future nest site where Charles has given her some prey recently, but Charles did not give her prey yesterday and they were hooting together. It's called a duet. And she was still doing these food-related calls. So at one point, she flew and landed next to Charles, and Charles flew off, which is something he does with females. But there was such a, a dynamic involved that it almost looked like Charles was saying to the female, go feed yourself. <laughs> and she flew and joined him again, did a few more hunger calls, and then stopped her hunger calls and just hooted with him. And this duet continued on and on. They eventually flew off over an, uh, well past an hour after sunset. And this duet had several different chapters to it. And I was with uh, my prowl, Al Prowl group last night and one of my friends and mentees, uh, Daria McKelvey. And we all thought, wow, that was possibly a big turning of the page in their couplehood in their coupledom and their being a pair that okay maybe there are bonding and clicking a little more so that was a very complex interesting thing and all of the interactions that happen each night whether it's just one owl doing its own thing or the two interacting or just the owls interacting with their environment one of the best things about studying owls is every night is different and unique. And it can be subtle little things to, oh my gosh, I've never seen that behavior. And I've seen behaviors I haven't read about and vice versa. Uh, and I do a great deal of research about owls and they're just endlessly fascinating on so many levels. Thank you for that. I, a duet like that must have just been absolutely you know, enthralling. I mean, I would have uh, these these owl prowls that you're talking about are really sounding very interesting. Along with the owl prowls and the public outreach that you do, you, you've just educated so many, and 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 I appreciate the education I'm I'm getting today too. This this idea of a no, duet just sounds, oh, it just sounds fascinating. What are some of the misconceptions that you get? from the public or during the owl prowl even about Great Horn Owl? Well, some of it is just something that I can share with them that, I mean, I knew a lot about wildlife, but I really knew nothing about owls. And I can say when I start to peel back and reveal the the amazing things about Great Horn Owls, it's just people just, wow, 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 is the response. Mm -hmm. And I think, yes, that's what it was like for me and continues to be. So in terms of misconceptions, sometimes people will think, well, owls, they're only active at night. Well, uh, I share with them one of the many words I've had to learn about studying owls. Many owls are nocturnal, active at night. Some are diurnal, active during the day. 
But I have to learn the word, and I've taught it to many people, the word crepuscular. C-R-E-P-U-S-C-A-L-A-R. Great for your next game of Scrabble. Mm -hmm. And when you're crepuscular, you're active at the edge of day and night, so around sunrise and sunset. And great for owls and many owls check two boxes. They are indeed nocturnal and crepuscular. So where I found Charles last night, where we began the owl prowl, was most likely the spot that he had found right around sunrise, picked that spot and slept there all day. And then we got to see him being crepuscular on the other side of the equation about an hour before sunset, starting to wake up, groom, stretch, hoot. We actually saw Charles eject a pellet, and I'll be talking about pellets and showing video of pellet ejection uh, for my Smithsonian Associates program. And then we got to see them start their night. So people understanding that, wow, it's not just, oh, they're active at midnight on type of thing, but they are, you can see them during the day. And also that, yes, indeed, owls are all over the place. People think, oh, you got to go out into the boonies to see them. Well, no, you don't. After this study, the, these years, is 18 years of study, I know you you probably started out with many questions, but but, but maybe you have more questions now about owls. Anything? I do. Perfect, perfectly phrased, Paul. It's the classic Socratic process of the more you learn, it's not saying, oh, look at all these things I know, but having a better understanding of how much you truly don't know. Mm-hmm. And I knew, again, I knew nothing about owls. I learned a lot, but I have more questions now than I did 18 years ago. Anything jump out? Anything that you want to share? Oh, yes. I mean, one of my biggest, I mean, I I have owl questions in general, and then I have questions specific to Charles and company. Mm -hmm. Um, One of my biggest questions about Charles is where was Charles hatched? Hmm. How did he come to Forest Park, and how did he pick his territory? One of the fascinating things about Charles is that his territory, while great owls are incredibly adaptable, his territory is absolutely perfect great owl habitat. Among the many things that make it so perfect is that there are many large trees that have cavities that the owls have used for nesting. Now, was Charles being picky, or was he lucky, or a bit of both? So that is a huge question. Where was he hatched? How did he come to Forest Park? How did he pick his territory? And yeah, I mean, I wish they would answer my emails, because (laughs) my questions are numerous, to put it mildly. Well, we will reach out, and hopefully they will pay attention, because I know you, you've got so much to share, and and, uh, and and they'll benefit, just just as we have, of course, Mark Lynch has been our guest. Mark is going to be presenting at Smithsonian Associates. We'll have lots of links so that our audience can find out more about Mark and his upcoming presentation. Final question for you, real quick, Mark. All of these urban areas are expanding, and, and great horned owls are adapting. Uh, human proximity is just a, a, a fact here. Do you see the trend of adaptation growing on the part of the great horned owls? Is it limiting them? Do we do we know whether or not great horned owls are going to be able to survive within these um, kind of these urban areas and, and thrive, or is it just a, a, a recipe for for disaster for us in terms of conservation? That's a great question, Paul. It's a it's a very complex situation mm-hmm. with great pronouns being so adaptable. It's not an all or nothing prospect, but it, it's a complex one. I mean, at a, at a certain point, they they do need space. And there are great hornals that are adaptable, but then they're at two human habitation and human activity. But then there are great hornals that are, yeah, indeed out in the boonies and are used to that space and so forth. So I think it's uh, definitely something to, to continue to monitor and not take the adaptability for granted, but at the same time, 
demonstrate how adaptable they are. One of the things that just blew my mind about great horned owls is learning what they can eat. And I'll be sharing this uh, in my Smithsonian talk but very quickly. They are right at the top of the food chain. They eat everything from things you would expect them to eat, like rodents and small birds. They also eat full-grown raccoons and great blue herons that are twice their size and almost everything. And one of the things that struck me about this as I read more about owls and thought more about owls and observed more of the owls was how much just in the United States alone, we have depleted the numbers and the geographic range of so many apex predators. But great horned owls, which only became protected in 1972, along with the other birds of prey as part of the Migratory Bird Act, great horned owls have flourished. Again, living in all these different places where other apex predators have not been able to survive. Black bears in Missouri have come back to such an extent that there is now a very, very limited hunting season for black bears. Well, that's only a few years old. Great horned owls just in Missouri are vast in number. So the human habitation thing is, is definitely a complex matrix and is, is something to really keep an eye on as history progresses. Award-winning naturalist with 18 years of experience observing the magnificent great horned owl, Mark Glinch, has been our guest today. Mark will be presenting at Smithsonian Associates coming up. Mark does much of his work in Forest Park, Missouri, or in the St. Louis uh, area. I think if anyone is in that St. Louis area, Mark would welcome uh, a uh, joining at one of his owl prowls. We'll have information about all of Mark's great work and his upcoming presentation at Smithsonian Associates. Mark, it's so great to talk to you. I, I could talk to you for a lot. There, There's so many more items and, and elements to the world of great horned owls, but I know you'll have audio clips, photos, videos, lots of great stuff that it's just going to bring our audience face-to-face with these wonderful birds. But thanks for your time today, and I look forward to your upcoming presentation. You're very welcome, Paul. Thank you so much to you and your listeners. I really appreciate you sharing the owls and my work with them, and I hope you can come out and see the owls in Forest Park sometime. Oh, I'd love it. I know. I know we'd all love it. Well, thank you, Mark. My thanks to Smithsonian Associate Mark Lenshaw for his time today and wonderful preparation. Mark Lenshaw will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up. The title of Mark Glenshaw's presentation is Great Horned Owls Hiding in Plain site. Please check out our show notes today for more information about Mark Lenshaw and his full presentation at Smithsonian Associates. My thanks to the Smithsonian team for all they do all the time to support our show. My thanks to you, our fantastic audience here on radio and podcast. Please be well, be safe, and let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next time. Thanks for joining us this week on the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Okay.